That was cool. Good to see everybody this morning. Good morning. I, uh, I do have one quick announcement to make. If uh, I know a couple of months back, uh, Dana had brought some uh, or talked about some T-shirts for Jordan uh, that she sold because Jordan's uh, of cancer. She has those T-shirts in. And uh, if you have your money, she'll be in the, uh, in the foyer. Immediately following services, you can pick up those, those T-shirts. Um, Thanksgiving's this week, if y'all didn't know. Nobody knew? I, I, I got to be honest. Um, I, I have this, this thing. Um, I, I often get accused of being a Grinch. And, um, and I'm not. I am, I am not a Grinch at all. I, I love Christmas season. I, I love what all goes on. I, I love the lights. I love the trees. I, I love it all. But I want it to stay in its own lane. Um, I, I saw a, uh, a character uh, cartoon or something on, I guess it was on Facebook, and it had this, this humongous blow-up turkey. You all seen this? You know, the kind you put in your yard. And this turkey is standing on top of a huge blow-up Santa Claus. And the sign says, wait your turn, fat man. And, um, and, and I, again, so I, I am all for Christmas, but it takes place after Thanksgiving, I think we need a time of Thanksgiving for all we have before we get into the absolute insanity of commercialism that has become the Christmas season. It's like, thankful for all you've given me, and I'm going to go blow it all on, these, on, on all these gifts and stuff. But anyway, Thanksgiving's coming up. I hope, and, and I hope that in this week you'll get to spend some time maybe with friends, maybe with family, and hopefully your thoughts will be full of Thanksgiving, full of praise not necessarily for the turkey or the ham or the sweet potato casserole although I'm thankful for all of that very much so um, but I hope you're thankful for all the ways in which God has blessed you and continues to bless you you know this idea of giving thanks or thanksgiving is nothing new biblically we find it all throughout the scripture the idea of praise goes goes hand in hand with an attitude of thanksgiving. We offer praise for that through which we are thankful for. Uh, these verses, Hebrews, um, I guess i got to turn this on. Uh, there, it buzzed in my hand. There we go. Hebrews 13, 5. Um, through him, through Jesus, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Psalm 50 Um, tells us this, to offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, of praise, and perform your vows to the Most High. In in both of these verses, I I found it very interesting, though, that that the writers connect that word sacrifice with praise. And and it reminded me of a time when when David was wanting to to offer up a sacrifice, but he didn't have what he needed, and, and, and Ornan comes and he offers to give him something, to sacrifice to God. And David says, no, I'm not going to accept what you're giving me to sacrifice to God. Because if, if you gave it to me and I sacrificed, it wouldn't be a sacrifice to me because it didn't cost me anything. Okay. If you remember the story, it's in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. David says this in verse 24. He says, but King David said to Ornan, no, I will buy, the, buy it for the full price. For I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. There's this idea of, of cost, this idea of sacrifice. David said, no, I'm not going to offer something that didn't cost me anything because then it wouldn't be a sacrifice. And when you think about it, the terms praise and sacrifice kind of seem to be opposite of one another. What does it mean then when the writers ask us to offer up a sacrifice of praise? Well, when you think about it, praise is, is often our response to something that has impressed us, right? I mean, you do something well and you get praise for it. You, uh, you, you bake a good cake and it tastes good. People tell you that's an awesome cake. You, you build something and it, and, it, and it serves its function. People praise you for how it's built. We're impressed by it. We feel generous with the praise to, to, to people who've done good things. We see what they've done and, and we praise them. Well, when we consider God, 
And we consider all that God has done for us and the way he blesses us and the way he answers our prayers and the way he has helped us, the way he protects us. And when all things go good for us, we feel very grateful and rightly so. And we praise him and rightly so. We sing praises to him as we've done. We worship him. We, we, we testify to the blessings that he has provided for us in our lives. We tell people how great and wonderful God is. And I believe God expects that kind of gratefulness from us. But is it a sacrifice? Does that cost us? You know, we all know and have probably experienced times in our lives when God doesn't come through the way we expect him to. Notice I, I didn't say God doesn't come through. But God doesn't come through in the way we want God to come through. In the way maybe that we hoped God would come through. Maybe the medical test comes back positive instead of negative. Maybe our kids aren't as faithful as we want them to be. Maybe the bills are piling up. Maybe we've lost those dear to us. Our prayers seem to be unanswered, and God can seem very far away at times. We can't see his goodness in our circumstances. We can't see what's good in our lives in the midst of all that is wrong. And sometimes it can look like God has forgotten us. Do you ever think about praising God at that moment? In those times, do you think about praising? I'm pretty sure the praise might be the last thing to bubble up for most of our hearts when things get tough. Because when things get tough, praise gets harder. But the reality is to praise God in those troubled times necessitates personal Sacrifice. This is the sacrifice of praise, which can often be difficult and can often be costly to us. Because it requires for us to wholly submit ourselves onto the altar of his will, even though we don't understand his ways. Even though we don't understand what's going on, even though we don't understand why the world is the way it is around us, why our lives are the way that it is right around us, when we can't see what's going on good, when we can't understand the blessings that come through Christ and, and he seems far away, it's at that moment that we have to submit ourselves to the will of God and say, I know I can't see it, but I trust that you are still in control, that you still have my best we're going to spend a couple of weeks in Psalm 34 in, in a very broad way. Psalm 34 is, is intriguing to me. It's one of the most beautiful psalms, I believe, in David's psalm book, so to speak. And in Psalm 34, verse 1, he says this. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, as this is the way, and if you go on, and, and I encourage you, read the rest of Psalm 34 and just hear the heart of David as he pours out this, this praise to God for, for so many things. And we'll touch on a few, okay? But, but, but here's what I want you to understand. It, it's when David wrote this psalm that intrigues me. It's, it's the circumstances of, of David's life that are going on when he writes I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my, in my mouth. And, and I got to be thinking, you know, the, 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 there's a part of me that wants to say, okay, I know when David wrote this. He wrote this after the kingdom had been given to him. He wrote this after he had been anointed king and he's, he's in Jerusalem and he's got his palace and things are going well and there's peace in the land and, and he's at one with God and he's at one with the people and everything's going perfect in his life. And so he writes, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth because everything is just as it's supposed to be. And nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth. You, maybe your psalm is titled in, in your Bible. 
And it may something, say something to the effect of a psalm when David feigned madness or pretended to be mad before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. You see, things weren't going in David's life as he expected them to go. When David was still young, Samuel anointed him to be the next ruler over Israel. He comes and before God says, David, you're going to be the next king. What does that do to a person? What does that do to a person's hopes and dreams and aspirations? What does it do to your self-confidence to know, I'm going to be the next king of Israel? God's kingdom, I'm going to be the king. And then, and then a little bit later on, there's, this, there's this, 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 this fight that's going on between Israel and the Philistines. And all of Israel is afraid to go out and fight Goliath because he's their giant, their mercenary who's come to fight for the Philistines. And, and David's appalled that no one will go out and fight him. And you know the story. David goes down, he gets his rocks, he takes his slingshot, he goes out, he drops this giant with one shot, and he cuts the dude's head off and he holds it up. And David becomes you know, he becomes hero to Israel. So he's going to be king. He's now got public opinion on his side. And, and not, only, not only has he done this great and marvelous deed by killing this great, big, huge giant, now the entire army is singing songs about him. They're making up songs about him. They're saying, Saul's killed his thousands, but David, David's killed his ten thousands. Right? So David's got to be thinking to himself, you know what? Life's pretty good. I'm on the fast track to the top. I've been anointed to be king. I took care of Goliath. I've got public opinion on my side. Everybody loves me. Except Saul, the king, who took all of this as a threat and then decides he wants to have David killed. And sets out to chase him all over the countryside trying to kill him. No longer favored. He's a fugitive on the run. And he finds himself, he finds himself, guess where? In Philistia. Remember the story? Goliath was a Philistine. Now David's on the run hiding out. And the first place he ends up in is in Gath where Goliath was from. I don't know if we can comprehend the level of fear or anxiety that David must have felt when he recognized where he was. The hometown of the champion he had just killed. And they recognize him. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? I mean, he's, he's famous, right? So in an attempt... To, to throw him off in an attempt to save his own life, David pretends to be insane. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. From anointed to king of Israel to, to walking around drooling and marking on buildings and acting like you're crazy just to save your skin. And Abimelech looks at him and he says, you know what? There is no fame, there is no glory in killing a madman. Just get him out of town. So David runs off and he hides in the cave of Adullam. And when he does, he pins, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually on my mouth. How do you get to that point? How do you get to that point where you say, I will bless the Lord at all times? Even when things are bad, even when your circumstances aren't going the way you want them to go, even when life beats you down. Imagine what David could have thought, right? He had a promise from God for the anointing to be king, but that's not working out. He's running all over the land of Israel. He ends up in the land of his enemies. He has to play like a madman to escape death. He could have questioned God for the circumstances in his life. God, why are you letting this happen to me? Why is all this going on? Kind of reminds me of the Israelites in Numbers chapter 11. You remember when God was taking care of them as they were going through the, 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 uh, the wilderness and they got tired of the bread. They got tired of the manna and, and they complained and they murmured to God, we don't want to eat this anymore. Although you're taking care of us, we don't want this. 
But here, instead of complaining about their circumstance, David, on the other side of it, says, you know what? I'm going to bless you, Lord, at all times. Matter of fact, not only at all times, your praise is going to be continually in my mouth. Read the entire psalm, and you can look into a grateful heart of a person who's grateful, irrespective of their circumstances, irrespective of what's going on. David chose to praise despite the storms in his life. This, this is the sacrifice of praise, I think we read about in Hebrews 13, 15. Again, through him, then let us offer continually up a sacrifice of praise to God. It's to be offered continually. Not, not, and, and, and I understand this. Well, you need to grasp this concept. Praise to God is not a reward we give to God for what he's given to us. Okay? We don't pay God with praise. We don't buy God with praise. We respond to God in praise because of how good he is. You remember Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16? You remember their story? They're, they're there and, and they get thrown in jail. And you remember what happens? Okay, let's just read it, 23 through 25. And when they, this is Paul and or, the people who put him in jail, when they had inflicted many blows upon them, them being Paul and Silas, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Again, this is one of those, one of those things where we go, you know, I can't relate to this. Right? I mean, they've been beaten, they've been jailed, they've been thrown into the worst or the inner part of the, I mean, they're, they're basically in solitary confinement in the middle of the, of the prison. They're locked up, right? And what are they doing? They're singing and they're praising God. Well, look at their circumstances. How bad are their circumstances? In that case, they're not dead, so it's not, that, that's positive. But aside from that, it couldn't get any worse. Their circumstances are awful, but yet they're praising God. God. And this worshipful heart, this, this heart of praise can only rise from a person who's chosen to honor God despite the pain that life is causing. Anybody suffered pain the last year? Emotional pain, spiritual pain, physical pain, economical pain. Uh, you take it. Anybody experienced pain? We all have, have we not? In one way or another. We can talk about what's bad all day long because there's an endless list of stuff that's bad. But we make a sacrifice of praise when we say, you know what? I trust God despite my circumstances. You know, God comes through for David in a big way. 2 Samuel 5, 4 through 5 says, David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years. And at Hebron, he reigned for, over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. Yeah, eventually God blessed David in the way that he thought he would. Were there times when, 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 when David didn't feel blessed? Obviously, but he still praised God. He still praised God. So the question then for us to answer this morning is simply this. How does this sacrifice of praise help us when we're in those circumstances that don't feel very praiseful? Okay? How do, how do we get to that point where we can say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will be in my mouth at all times. How do you do that when we're surrounded by so much bad the first thing I want to pose to you is this. A sacrifice of praise lifts the spirit of heaviness within us. Anybody ever felt this way? Especially in the last couple of years? I got to thinking about it. It was actually about two years ago when the whole COVID thing started. Two years ago. Then we had two weeks to flatten the curve. It was a long two weeks. Right? Right? And we've gone up and down and up and down and all the way around. And I know many of you have had it and many of you are suffering. And, and, and despite all of that, I mean, we could go through a laundry list of stuff that's, that's happening and is still going on. If you want bad, can you find it? Sure you can. It's everywhere. If you want bad, you can find it. And it creates in us this, this heaviness, this dread, this, this emotional weight that sits on us like a wet blanket and weighs us down. 
Isaiah the prophet, though, likens this idea of praise to clothes that can lift that heaviness off. Listen to what he says. Isaiah 61, 3. And he's talking to Israel, but he says this, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Listen, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. You know, it's a, it's a mistake to wait until your problems are solved before you praise God. Rather, praise is the key to unlocking those problems and letting them go. Charles Spurgeon, the, the old preacher, said it best this way. He said, my happiest moments are when I'm worshiping God, really adoring the Lord Jesus. In that worship, I forget the cares of the church and everything else. To me, it is the nearest approach to what it will be in heaven. You feel like that when you worship God? I hope so. I, I hope this becomes a respite. I hope when you come together with this body, or even when you're by yourself and you're singing songs, I, I hope that in those moments of worship, all the cares of this world kind of fade away. That you kind of feel like, okay, I don't have to worry about that stuff now. We put it on hold when we come in here sometimes, right? We know as soon as we go back out the doors, those problems are still there. The condition in the world is still there. The problems of, uh, of inflation, all that stuff is still going to be there. But you know what? Just for a little bit of time, I'm going to come in and I'm going to focus and I'm going to praise God. And for that little bit of time, it's almost as if that wet, heavy blanket just gets lifted up off of us and we don't feel the weight of the world How does it work? I don't exactly know. But I think when we sing songs and we offer God our praise, I think it reminds us through the words of the songs, through the prayers that we offer, through, through, through seeing one another, I think it reminds us, even for just a minute, that God is so much bigger than any problems we might have. The reality is God's bigger than anything that's out there. And as bad as it may look, as bad as it may seem, as bad as it may feel, you know what? God is bigger. I think we need to go back to, I think we need to go back to preschool. I've said this before. We as adults, we need to go back to preschool. And we need to get in a line. And we need to sing that song over and over again. My God is so big so strong and so i forgot the little signs so strong and so mighty so strong and so mighty there's what nothing my god cannot do do we remember how big god is man praise will do that for you and when you see how big he is it kind of lifts that that weightiness off the second thing i want to point out is simply this sacrifice of praise will make the enemy flee i got a story i want to share with you and it's it's one of my favorite it's a really cool story in the bible if you got your bibles go to second chronicles chapter 20 i want to set the stage real quick okay um in second chronicles chapter 20 jehoshaphat is king um he's ruling judah and 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 israel and, and there's, a, there's a thing that happens when the Moabites and the Ammonites and the <coughs> Meonites come together and they form this coalition to attack Judah. And, and Ju Je Je I can't talk. Jehoshaphat's looking at the situation and, and he sees militarily what's going on and some guys come to tell him, okay, we've kind of we've surveyed what's going on and, and here's, our, here's our response. Militarily, here's what they say. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed to fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Okay, you get the story. They're outnumbered, they're afraid. Jehoshaphat knows that on his own, with only the, the, the resources he has in Judah and Israel, he can't win. He's got three different nations coming together against him, and he knows he's in trouble. But, but Jehoshaphat does what we do often when we face a, a problem that's beyond our control. We go find help, right? If there's something that you need that you don't know how to handle or you can't handle on your own, hope, on your own hopefully you go find help. Help from someone. And, and Jehoshaphat does that, but he goes to the perfect place to find help, and that's to God. He goes to God, and, and he, matter of fact, he, he petitions the entire nation 
to go to God. And they all come together and they seek his help. Notice what they don't do. They don't start sharpening their swords. They don't start counting their weapons. Why? Because they know militarily they don't have a chance. They don't have a chance. Right? And so God comes through and God speaks and he tells them, okay, here's the military plan for you, Jehoshaphat. This ought to sound familiar. All right? Verse 16 and 17. This is God speaking. And he says, tomorrow, go down against them. In other words, get all your people and go down to where the enemy is. Behold, they will come up from the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. God's already said, listen, I even know where they're going to be. I know how they're going to come. I know their attack route. I want you to go down there to meet them. But then what does he say next? You will not need to fight. Wait a minute. I thought we were going to war. You are, but don't fight. Okay? Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. I can understand the, the commanders of whatever army he had listening to this going, okay, let me understand the plan. We know where they're coming from. They're in this valley. And you want us to go down there and stand in front of them as they come. Yeah, you got that right. And you don't want us to fight. Yeah, you got that right too. Just stand there in front of them. Don't give them any ground. You know what that sounds like to me? Target practice. I, right? Go stand out in front of the enemy. Don't fight. Just stand your ground. Okay? Now look what happens next. Verse 20 and 21. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. As they went before the army and say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, of Moab, and of Mount Seir who had come against Judah so that they were routed. You go back and you read the entire story. You'll see what happens. But, but what I find completely interesting here, this so much reminds me of Jericho, right? They, they, come, into, they come into Canaan and their first, their first place they hit is Jericho and they're going to attack the city with its walls and God says, okay, I got a plan, strike up the band, right? And, and, and have the band march around and play and blow your horns. And, and they got to be thinking, you're okay, God, Really? And the people in Jericho had to be laughing their heads off, looking down. Oh, what? The band's going to knock our walls down? Okay. Well, now we make it to Second Chronicles. We're not using the band anymore. Now we're using the choir. And Jehoshaphat takes, basically forms a worship team to go out in front of, the, in front of Israel to say, okay, as we move forward, here's what I want you to sing. Okay, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. The choir's up front. I can see Tara Smith probably out there directing. She's got her quartet right out there in front, right? And she's like, how are you going to attack? Tara's our lead commander, man. She's going to get the quartet going. We're going to sing. And they're going to say, I bet it was beautiful. I bet, but I also bet the people on the army on the other side were laughing their heads off. You're going to sing us to death? Really? But what happens is God throws them into so much confusion that the armies that had come out against Israel start fighting each other instead of Israel. And Israel's given this huge victory, not because of how well the choir sang, but because of God. But, but here's my point. Here's, what, here, here's my point of this whole thing. The sacrifice of praise will eliminate, will move the enemy and make him flee. Okay? You see, what happens is this the devil has plans for you, Satan has plans for us, and they're not good. 
And he wants to keep you down. He wants to keep you weighed down. He wants to keep you sad. He wants, to feel, he wants you to feel like, like, like nothing ever works. He wants you to feel like God has forsaken you. He wants you to feel like this world is awful and terrible and there's nothing you can do about it and there's nothing God can do about it and it's awful and it's terrible and all you need to do is focus on how bad things are and how negative. That's what the devil wants from you. But a sacrifice of praise will tell him to get. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Get him out of there. His plans are pulled down and destroyed when we offer up a sacrifice of praise. Which leads me to the last, and that's simply this. A sacrifice of praise leaves no room for complaining or negativity. Let me ask you, be honest. Is there enough negativity in the world already? Do we need to add to it? No, we don't. And many times our prayers are filled with complaints about our problems. God knows our hearts and cares and all that concerns us. However, a sacrifice of praise lifts the focus off of our struggles and helps us focus on him we are reminded of what he has done in our lives. We're reminded of that God knows what concerns us. David knew this well. It was our, our, our I think it was our scripture reading this morning. Bless the Lord. This is, this is a, an action. I will bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Man, this, this is a pattern for praise if you need it. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Don't forget how good God is, who forgives you all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your mouth is renewed like the eagles. Let me tell you some church, it's hard to dwell on all of the possible negatives in life. And I know there are plenty. I know our world is full of all kinds of possible negatives, but it's difficult to dwell on the negatives when you're consistently dwelling on what's positive on what's good, on what's right. Remember Paul's admonition to the church in Philippi when he tells them, rejoice in the Lord. When? When things are good, when things are going your way, when there are no problems in life, when there are no problems in the world, when everything goes like you want it to go, then rejoice in the Lord? No, rejoice in the Lord when? Always, say it loud. When? Always. Thank you. Again, matter of fact, he repeats himself. Again, I will say rejoice. And you say, but how? Ken, everything's bad. Everything's bad. Turn on the news. There's fighting. There's racial unrest. There's social unrest. There's inflation. There's supply chain uh, shortages. You don't know if you're going to get your presents here in time for Christmas or not. Anybody had that thought? Of course you have. Ordered it from Amazon. They said it'd be here in two weeks. It's going to be in four months. Who knows? Right? You, you make a lane change too fast on the interstate and some guy waves at you for the next two miles, right? People are angry. Let me tell you something. You can focus on all of that. Or you can focus on what's good. Paul doesn't leave us. He, he, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Say, how? Well, it's easy. Do it this way. He says, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's noble, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. If there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, then what? Think on these things. And I know it can be difficult. I get it. But it's a choice we make. We can either think about what's wrong or we can think about what's right, what's good. Where's your focus? Where is your sacrifice of praise? Is it for all that God has and continues to bless you with? Because that's so much. Man, this morning, if you are one of those, if you've responded to God in faith, if you've confessed the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life, if you've repented of your sins, if you've participated in his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism, then, then despite what this world has thrown at you and what this world is throwing at you and what this world will throw at you, you need to realize that you are...
You have been blessed with, with the forgiveness of your sins. You've been blessed with grace, with mercy, with restoration. You've been blessed with the freedom from sin. You've been blessed with long, lifelong purpose. You've been blessed with the very perfect father figure in your life. You've got kinship with Jesus Christ. You've got the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You've got heaven to look forward to. You have a church family that surrounds you. You have abundant joy that comes from the peace that surpasses all understanding and the knowledge that Christ has died for your sins. You are blessed. Above all, you have reason to be thankful, not just on Thursday in November, but every time you wake up in the morning. And don't get me wrong, I am not anti-Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving at its proper time. But what I'm saying is simply this. We don't need a national holiday to be thankful people. As believers in Jesus Christ, we should be the most thankful people on the planet, despite whatever circumstances are going on on the planet. Because this world is not our home. We're just passing through it. But let's make it the best home we can as we pass through it. Let's be thankful people. Let's be people who consistently and continually offer a sacrifice of praise to our God. And let us be the kind of people who will always look to God and say, for all that you have done, God, for all that you have done, and I can't even begin to count what all you have done, but for all that you have done, God, thank you. And for all that you will do, thank you. And for all that you've kept me from, thank you. I don't deserve it, but thank you. This morning, maybe you need the prayers of this church to recognize just how blessed you are. Just how thankful you need to be. Maybe you're not in a relationship. Maybe, maybe that I, what I described was not you. Maybe you have not committed your life to Jesus Christ, submitted to his will for you to be baptized. Maybe you haven't invited his lordship into your life so that he can bless you. And I, 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 this isn't a quid pro quo where, where God owes you something for your response. But God will bless you beyond your wildest imaginations. And if you need to do that this morning, the invitation is always yours. Whatever you need, I invite you to come let us know as we stand, as we sing.